Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Now we will start the 17th session. Uh, there is some change in the uh, speaker uh, order. We have two speakers in this session only. Uh, the first will be Junaid Khan uh, from Rahba John Hopkins in Pakistan, and second will be uh, Dr. Khalaf Gargari from Dohuk University from Iraq. Uh, we will start with Dr. Junaid Khan. Taban, shukr kul shukr lil asadz al qaimin ala haza al mu'tamar al azim. تنظيما وترتيبا استاذ دكتور وائل بحبح واستاذ دكتور محمد زنون نقول لهم الف مبروك هم وكل الاستاف اللي بيرتبوا لهذا اللقاء الدولي تفضل دكتور Uh, th thank you very much, uh, the chairpersons, and uh, thank you very much, the organizing, espe especially the Dr. Weil Baba and uh, Dr. Uh, Zunnoon. Uh, I switch back to the uh, surfactant delivery, the no novel approaches. Uh, in the first lecture, my friend uh, Raya uh, talked about the surfactant uh, thing, so I'm a little bit of disagreement because the cost effectiveness if you give the surfactants is much less and I will uh, uh, thresh some data because data to interpret is not that very uh, easy. Uh, I have uh, to disclose that I have nothing to disclose. In 2006, uh, Alan Joe, very famous neonatologist said there is nothing more dangerous to the preterm lung uh, then an anxious physician with an endotracheal tube. And really, the tube, if you tube the baby, only the three to five breaths with the bag and mask ventilation can give you the injury in the, uh, in the lungs uh, in, the, in your uh, patients. So this is the very important uh, message. Now, uh, I will talk about that how you can give surfactant uh, and what are the uh, randomized controlled trials. There are some generalization which we are talking in the morning and now also that uh, avoiding limiting invasive ventilation is desirable. Yes, it is the most important thing. But if you use it appropriately then, if you use the optimal thing appropriately, it still has some side effect. But if you use it inappropriately, if you don't develop your skill in non-invasive uh, ventilation, then it becomes unnecessary evils, which is very dangerous to the health of your, uh, of the, your patients. Now, non-invasive um, ventilation, the generalization is that there are many things we have, CPAP, NIP, APC, high flow, and low flow nasal cannula, and these are all kind of a less invasive therapy with their own side effects. And it can uh, be a little bit of cumbersome uh, to our uh, newborn, uh, very premature babies. The reason we are talking about is that, that the bronchopulmonary dysplasia, the crowning leak disease, a very uh, devastating disease, is going in a rise. It come to the plateau in uh, 2000, but it is again going up. The smaller the gestational age you are saving the baby, the higher the uh, chances of having chronic lung disease. So if you do the incidence, and this is the major study coming out, almost 19,000 infant very premature, uh, out of which 61%, which is almost 12,000 babies, initially managed on the CPAP. But you know that the data interpretation is different. Yes, we are very excited, use non-invasive, don't intubate, but the failure rate in the smaller babies is a whopping 43%, and 29 to 32 weeks is 21% failure rate. And if the baby fails the CPAP, then it is very difficult because it intubated, it a very high cost, and the baby have a great chance to all comorbidities, the ROPs, the chronic lung disease, and the interventricular hemorrhages. Now, the data of, uh, uh, is not that very quality evidence. Uh, this is uh, also published in JAMA in 2016, and they calculate all the studies, and they found it out a lot of biases. 
if you are in certain country, whatever the kind of a study, it is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I am not saying, uh, I have no humility to say that. If you are particularly from that uh, country, it is published in uh, thing, whatever the data you have. There's a lot of heterogeneity. The meta-analyses are uh, combining the apple and oranges and give you some results. So, if you talk about the uh, non-invasive ventilation, you can find none of those data show you the strong evidence are low, very low and moderate. But our, we are handicapped, what we can do, this is the only availability. So all this uh, we have up till now that we do, should do the non-invasive ventilation and we give the uh, CPAP, but the CPAP failure rate is very high. What we can do what, uh, about the surfactant replacement, all those babies less than 34 weeks of age, they are deplenished in surfactant and surfactant is essential for the lung development. Uh, if you give early surfactant, then the chances of neonatal mortality, pneumothoracic, PIE is decreased. The, there's no uh, difference in the BPD, but the combined uh, rate of BPD and death is decreased. It gives the uh, algorithm. So this is the algorithm what we are using, that the premature baby more than 27 weeks, we start with the verbal CPAP. If it is maintained, then we continue with it. If it is not, then we give uh, surfactant by the LISA technique or less invasive technique, and then we uh, continue on the CPAP. If it is cardiovascular compromise, then we have no option other than to continue with intubation and try to extubate as soon as possible. Same with the guidelines, just came out uh, uh, with a very small baby, less than 26 weaker, and it is also we have to give the caffeine and um, start the uh, CPAP with the uh, surfactant. All this give uh, an idea that if we give the very early surfactant without mandatory ve ventilation, then what can happen? So it will... Uh, it, this is the randomized controlled trial with the 280 babies and it's randomized to the intubation uh, uh, surfactant and the CPAP alone. And what they found it out that the need for mechanical ventilation is decreased in those babies, air leak is also decreased in, in those babies. Yes, a little bit uh, you have to give the surfactant, but it is it's still, uh, if you talk about the cost effectiveness, it's much more cost effective than to go into the mechanical ventilation. So conclusion for up till now is that, that we have to have something which we can give non-invasively the surfactant and to continue with the CPAP. And it developed the hypothesis. So you know, uh, when we do the research, you have the hypothesis, then you have the synthesis, then you have a resynthesis, and then you produce your thesis. So the hypothesis is that, that if we would even less invasive surfactant uh, administration to a spontaneously breathing neonate improve outcome further. And there are many um, uh, studies done, and this is a timeline, not from now, it's from 1980s to 2019. I will give you the data in the chronological orders. And there are four major uh, things they are looking into it. Pharyngeal administration of surfactant, uh, aerosolized, LMA guided, and the thin catheter. We'll go through the uh, one by one. The in, uh, first of all, the if you give the surfactant in the uh, uh, pharynx. So this is a randomized controlled trial in 328 preterm infant in 1987, where the babies are not that young uh, um, or not that less viable age is uh, surviving. So 25 to 29 week gestation at 1987 is a real uh, big test. So as you can see that uh, they give the uh, surfactant or artificial lung expanding compound because the real surfactant was not available at that time and what they found it out that the neonatal mortality is decreased, uh, the uh, hemorrhage, parenchymal brand hemorrhage is in, decreased and the severe RDS is also uh, decreased in those babies. Another one uh, is the technique that before delivering the baby at the intrapartum, you give the surfactant, give two puffs uh, with the, continue with the, uh, the CPAP. And this is also a small babies from 560 gram to 1840. What they found it out that this procedure is uh, relatively safe and simple and they decrease the need of intubation. 
So since 1987, we are thinking of that, and this is uh, the published by the Dr. Catwinkle in 2004. So these are the, all the studies. If you are interested, you can go through it. The second thing which we are looking into it is the LMA. LMA is the laryngeal mask airway, which is very easy to uh, introduce, and you don't need to have a lot of skills uh, uh, for that. The LMA didn't get that much attention because of the many reasons. The reason is that the feasible trials are um, small, is only eight infant, but whatever the trials we have, it shows some improvement in the AAPO2, which is the post-surfactant uh, uh, in the red and the pre-surfactant in the uh, pink one, uh, which is uh, after the LMA uh, introduction. Uh, there is another trial in 2013, which is again a small trial, 26 um, uh, infant, and they couldn't find any difference if you give uh, through the LMA, this thing. So these are the lot of studies, and uh, the one study is still going on, uh, published maybe 2020 or by the end of this year. Aerosolized surfactant, if this come and if, if this is approved, then it is be very, very uh, revolutionized. This is the surfactant uh, which is given by the nebulizers. And initial studies which I'm showing is a, uh, showed a very good result. So 20 preterm infant, uh, this is not that, uh, as I'm telling you, I'm going in a chronological order. 1997, it showed that it uh, decreased the alveolar oxygen gradient. It decreased the Silverman score. This is the Silverman score, which is the uh, higher the score, the sicker the baby, the lower the score is um, better for it. So it decreased the Silverman score and it maintained the PaCO2. So it is about in 1997. Now, if you move on to 2000, again, it's a small study, but it showed no effect. So this is the difference. This is the way you do the studies and you get the results. Then, uh, this is the open, sorry about that, it's a open label studies which is in uh, 2010. They randomized uh, into two uh, groups which is three retreatment or uh, by at least three hours apart or at least one hour apart. And they found a good result that you decrease the oxygen requirement. Oxygen is the very harmful for those babies uh, less than 34 weeks of age. So you decrease the oxygen from 40% um, baseline to 32, and uh, later on, you don't need to be intubated. Again, it is a very nice study done in 2013, which is called CureNab studies, it's smaller babies, 29 to 33 weeks of age and the primary outcome they are looking for need for intubation. They found it out in this uh, uh, graph that uh, the solid line, which is the black line, is the probability to get the intubated of those babies are very, very low as compared to the dashed line, which is the probability of intubation only with the CPAP is higher. So I'm telling you is a very subtle things which can improve your baby um, a lot. Again, uh, this is a very recent July 2018, and uh, it is going to be republished because it is not published uh, again. So it's July 2019 again that early postnatal nebulized surfactant may reduce the need for intubation in the first three days of the life. Uh, there are many studies, and many studies shows in the favor of it. Uh, again, the two studies are ongoing, and these are the major studies. After that, it is, will be available in the market, and it can be revolutionized the uh, care of uh, newborn babies. Now, the last thing which we are using is the MIST technique or the LISA or less invasive surfactant administration. We put the feeding tube or any catheter like a, a, uh, 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 UAC and give the surfactant uh, through that into the larynx. The first study was in 2010 in, uh, by the, uh, Dr. Angela Cripps, and she uh, performed a huge study, an observational study. The babies on the CPAP, no sedation, no NLGC are required. They put the uh, NG tube uh, and they give the surfactant through it. And what they found it out, the mechanical ventilation first uh, 72 hours is decreased, BPD uh, decreased slightly, death and BPD decreased slightly, and oxygen at the time of discharge decreased significantly. 
significantly. So it is a very um, handsome and very strong evidence uh, in favor of that. Then there is a trial called avoidance of uh, mechanical ventilation or AVM trial, huge trial, 220 infant and all are less than 1500. So really are very small babies, randomized to surfactant uh, via the uh, ET catheter and primary outcome the same, the mechanical ventilation or uh, retention of the PCO2. Again, the uh, results are very good. The mechanical ventilation days are decreased. Any mechanical ventilation is decreased and oxygen day at 28 uh, days of the life, which is the old BPD definition is decreased. Uh, the another study uh, by Dockwell in 2012 with 61 new nates also uh, present the similar kind of a data with the ET catheter. Uh, historical controls group uh, are the CPAP group and what they found it out, the mechanical ventilation, the oxygen days is decreased in those babies. But in this study, they have to treat the PDA uh, and the, the treatment for the PDA is high. So this is one of the uh, caveat in this uh, study. Take care study is uh, 200 uh, infant with the less than 32 weeks is randomized to surfactant via five French catheters which we are using and primary outcome need for mechanical ventilation. Again, the result showing a lot uh, improvement that the decreased need of intermittent uh, mandatory ventilation, decreased rate of CPAP failure and decreased rate of uh, bronchopulmonary uh, dysplasia. So all these, uh, all these effect and the data are uh, showing that if you do a, not to go into a very high fire techniques or the ventilation or the high frequency, you will be uh, very well uh, doing uh, with the patients uh, of very young age, uh, gestational age. Uh, NINSAP study is 2011 uh, uh, um, babies, uh, 2015, and it shows the data that is intubated is decreased. Survival with BPD is the same, but survival with no adverse uh, effect is uh, more is <coughs> statistically significant. Also, the pneumothorax is much decreased in those babies. Severe IVH with the very uh, uh, bad comorbidity is also uh, decreased. This is the latest uh, from uh, 2017. Um, uh, it's published in Journal of Neonatal Perinatology, and again, it shows that it has re reduced the 60% rate of mechanical ventilation. So the CPAP reduced 40%, 60% failure. If you take then additional 10%, you can decrease if you give the surfactant rate uh, with the uh, a small catheter. So you will uh, cover the cost of your uh, surfactant with that. 2018 data shows the similar, the LISA technique reduced the composite outcome of death or the BPD at 36 weeks is equal to is a 75% uh, decrease in the rate. Now, uh, low resource uh, um, countries, this is uh, uh, my country in Pakistan, uh, we did uh, this uh, also in a less than 32 weeks and we found it out that if we give the uh, surfactant very early, within one and two hours of the life, we reduce the intubation, we reduce the mechanical ventilation and this is very, very cost uh, effective. It is just published in 2019. Uh, you can go through it. Uh, it's a very uh, uh, great work in the low resources country. Uh, this is very important. I want to show you in 2016. This is a very different kind of a study. Of course, what they did, they took the seven studies, seven strategies, sorry, uh, including CPAP alone, CPAP plus surfactant, which is insured, then LISA, then NIPPV, nebulized surfactant, surfactant given by laryngeal mask and mechanical ventilation. And they combined 30 trials. It is in Japan, they did it and about 6,000 infant, and the primary outcome was a death or BPD. And what they want to know, that what is the highest rank of this strategy to get a very good outcome. So ranking probability strategies, if the young uh, physicians are sitting, must see this uh, kind of a data. You can critically uh, appraise this, and this is a very important study because ranking probability strategies, studies are very, very rare. What they found it out, death or the chronic lung disease, the LISA is the one, uh, number one, which is 94% chance you have a success. And if you 
uh, get the bronchopulmonary dysplasia alone, again, it is uh, Lisa is ranked as a number one, which is 89% uh, chance that you get, get uh, success with this uh, technique. So these are the all studies, and uh, one is going on still. Uh, this is available, and we have to know. So in the last uh, two minutes, uh, uh, three minutes, I must say that whatever you are doing, you should develop your skills. Even with the LISA technique, is uh, not very, very um, uh, uh, free of uh, cumbersome. You have to develop how to do where the very soft catheter to uh, put it into the trachea. And these are the things that you have to select the babies, which uh, babies you are going to do that. To summarize that, uh, the CPAP uh, with the surfactant is a very good uh, option. It is maybe beneficial. Its reduction of the neonatal complications seems possible. Uh, these are the evidence. The, if you, the babies is less than 26 weeks, you can tolerate up to 30% oxygen. After that, you have to give uh, surfactant through LISA technique. If it is more than 26 weeks, you can tolerate up to 40%. And if the baby is not doing well, then you have to uh, do the LISA technique. Again, LISA or the MIS can be alternative not to intubate the baby, and it is alternative. A second and sometimes third dose of the surfactant is needed. And uh, it depends that how you uh, maintain the baby on the CPAP. Uh, last but not the least, uh, what we are doing in our unit, both in uh, John Hopkins in Maryland and uh, in Abu Dhabi, all premature, anticipated premature babies uh, get the mother get the antenatal uh, steroids. If if it is more than 27 weeks, we start with the CPAP tolerate about 30% oxygen and titrate. If not, it's, uh, we intubate, give the surfactant, try to extubate as soon as possible. If less than 27 weeks, we stabilize the baby on CPAP, bring the baby to our uh, NIC unit, and then we will see, uh, uh, we give the surfactant by the LISA. Saturation we maintain uh, less than 1,500 gram or 32 weeks is about 90 to 96 percent. Hemodynamic stability, we use non-invasive minimum handling uh, uh, for that. Head in the midline position for 72 hours, this is because of the prevention of IVH. Golden hour, we are religiously follow that, and we have to finish everything and stabilize this baby in the first hour of the life. Cranial ultrasound, we have the new technology called uh, NIRS, which is near infrared spectroscopy. It measures your brain and the tissue oxygenation, which give you an idea that how you are doing it. Nutrition is very important. We start the nutrition right away, uh, t whatever the baby is sick or uh, not, the, uh, start a TPN. We start the feeding one to two days, okay? If we if we have the breast milk, we start right away, day one. If we don't, we usually use uh, weight only up till 24 to 48 hours. We remove the UAC, UVC less than seven days and place pick line if needed. Minimum handling and the uh, kangaroo care, which is the uh, good for that. So in the end, I must emphasize on the data that Please do not put your faith in what the statistics say until you have carefully what they don't say to you. So be careful when you uh, um, uh, evaluate the data. And why I am saying that? Because absence of evidence is not the evidence of the absence. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Professor Han, for uh, illustrating lecture. And the floor is now open for uh, Discussion questions? So I have a few comments about your sure. lecture. Uh, now uh, there are, I think, two promising techniques for less invasive surfactant administration. One is aerosolization and nebulization, but this will uh, lead to much costs because you have to do, use a large dose of surfactant and you have to use a special type of nebulizer which is not available anywhere. Uh, the second is the LISA technique and there is now a shift to, from inshore technique to LISA technique and most units in Europe and uh, North America, they start using the LISA technique. The problem is that not all LISA are the same yes. and uh, many units have differences and the type of catheter you use, whether you use a vascular catheter or feeding tube or umbilical catheter. 
uh, also the difference in the selection of babies sure. for the use of uh, surfactant. Some units start prophylactic surfactant for babies less than 25 weeks. Uh, others, or most of the others use uh, early rescue surfactant uh, according to oxygenation. Mm -hmm. And other units consider other factors rather than oxygenation in the selection exactly. of the patient. So, so the thing is that, uh, that's why I said that we have to develop according to our unit. Uh, we cannot standardize on this thing. Uh, what is the population of your uh, unit? What is their uh, viability age? Uh, somewhere, uh, we, we are actually uh, going up to 23 weeks, okay? But not all the unit can go up to 23 weeks. So this is the, the very important, this is the selection of the babies. And selection of the surfactant, uh, there is some data that uh, PuroSurf is a little bit better than uh, other uh, surfactant, but uh, I don't have any strong evidence for that. The technique is the one which you develop. So, for example, in our unit, both in Maryland and Abu Dhabi, that our specialists, the fellows and the resident, they develop the technique with the um, feeding tube. And they are, we are using the five French uh, catheter. Uh, we just put it in and they all uh, are able to do it uh, very easily. So this is the thing which I mentioned that you have to develop the skill first uh, uh, and then uh, go to the uh, technique or the new uh, evaluation because if you jump into it then many times it happened I saw initially that the surfactant all come out from the nose and uh, everything and it will not go it, and the, the, the baby, uh, baby will be sad because it's not that easy with the five French catheter because it's very flexible tube and you cannot put the guide wire also. So it, it is the first you have to develop the technique but once you develop the technique it is very easy for the baby. The baby is breathing on the CPAP. You don't have to remove it from that. And you just put a, a laryngoscope and put it uh, with the catheter and nothing will happen. Uh, and baby will not require any other further uh, intervention, the mechanical ventilation. So it is just to develop your uh, system and your uh, skills in that. It will be very easy for that. The other issue is the pre-medication, and I think uh, in pre Germany they started it without pre-medication, exactly. but in Scandinavia they are using uh, uh, yeah, morphia we, and fentanyl and even uh, propofol. Sure. Uh, it, it's, uh, we are not using in pre-medication uh, in any uh, gestational age, uh, uh, even if it is a, let's say, severe condition, uh, 32, 34 weeks, uh, sometime we have to uh, give the surfactant. But uh, the smaller babies also, we are not using any sedation because baby was uh, very comfortable and uh, we just take uh, within, uh, you know, seconds, we just give the thing and one push, we give the uh, dose of the surfactant and then uh, we remove the tube. Okay, thanks, Dr. Khan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I have the pleasure to introduce Professor Khalaf to talk about gut health early life, role of gut microbiota. Uh, first of all, uh, our foreign guests are not here. I would like to thank Dr. Wael Bahbah while Dr. Muhammad Zannoun for their uh, preparation for this event and inviting me. Thank you for the support of the committee and the members of the committee. And thank you for the support of the ICC for what we found out of them. Chairperson, they allow me, I want to move just in, to be in the middle. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, gut microbiota. You know, we started with dealing with premature Dr. Wright, and then Dr. Fawaz talking about bowel and inflammatory, and then those small babies with the size of the, of the, uh, of, with the, size of the fist. I hope I'm, I'm going to give something which is uh, different with a different test, and I hope it will be palatable by the chairpersons and by the uh, audience. Uh, 
Um, first of all, before uh, uh, saying anything, I have no conflict of, of interest in my presentation. Uh, the second point, I want to, to talk about my city. I am from Iraq. The hook is uh, at the north of Iraq, uh, just near the border of uh, Turkey and uh, Syrian uh, border, very close to it. Uh, uh, it is about 400 kilometers drive from uh, Baghdad. The second point, I have just to, to show you those very nice pictures. I don't know if you have heard about my city. Uh, it is one of the best and the safest city, uh, I guess, in the world. Uh, I'm going to talk about, to ask a question, uh, which percentage of, of my talk are you going to, to remember or recall after 24 hours? Some may say that it will be up to 90%, coming 75, down, down to 50, down to 10, down to 5%, and we depend on a uh, learning triangle, actually. We have the, 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 the passive and we have the active one. If someone is going just to listen to this talk, he's going to remember like 5%. If he is going to uh, practice by doing this, he's going to learn, uh, recall that 75%. But if he is going to teach others, he, he or she will, will recall more than 90% of this uh, talk. The other point I'm going to, to, to raise here before going to the role of gut microbiota in the health and well-being, what is the role of us as a pediatrician in the community? The other top of our priorities is the support of the breastfeeding. And you all know the World Health Assembly and also the baby-friendly hospitals. You know, long years ago, we should teach all the mothers, even before the, the conception and during gestation and after that, the, successful, uh, the, the method of successful uh, breastfeeding. Going back to my uh, talk, I'm going to talk shortly about how the gut microbiota, the residents of uh, our gut, affect our health and immunity and well-being. Now, I mean in the early life and later on uh, as an, uh, adults. And actually, this is a very hot topic, a, a new topic, and it is an area for research to invest in it because it has a great uh, outcome. And I think in the previous sessions, many of the colleagues they comment, they give some hints about the role of gut microbiota and microbiome in the uh, life. So, actually, the gut microbiota is an, an, a diverse ecosystem. We, we have more than 100 trillion of bacteria residing in our gut, and it, it constitutes like 2 kg of our body weight. And there are more than 1,000 different bacterial species in our gut. And those bacteria, I mean, uh, the bacterial cells, they, they constitute 90% of the cells in the body of the human ear are bacteria, while only 10% are human cells. And those rep represent like one, more than 1 million gene representing them, while the human genome, our genome is only 23,000 uh, uh, genes, a vast uh, difference. And also, the, the composition actually is unique per person and even per time. I mean, the same person may be at the morning, at the noon, at, at, at the night, they have different uh, 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 types or, and, and diversity of those uh, bacteria. Those, the, the bacteria which resides in, in uh, our body, as I said, it is a diverse and it is changeable over uh, the time. But it is also affected by the environment, like pH of the stomach, and also by the molecules and the nutrient available uh, for them. But as we go further in the, in the gut, the, the concentration and the diversity will be much more. When you reach the colon, we have like 10 power 11 to 10 power 12 colony forming units per uh, mill. And this is a, a big number, actually. The, the factors which affect the composition and the diversity of the gut microbiota, actually, there are multiple uh, factors, but it is not only one of them. The diet which we take, our lifestyle, our hygiene, our environment, the stressful conditions, and, we, and as we are going to see, uh, 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 all stressful conditions, it will affect in a way or another the, the composition, the environmental factors, and I will concentrate on the use of antibiotics. And actually, in my area, this is one of the big problems uh, anyone 
has, is authorized to give antibiotics and to sell antibiotics, and this is a big issue and a major issue, really, and it is a threat to our, uh, our globe. It is an e ecological threat to our uh, globe. Uh, the gut microbiota, it, you know, we have the three functions of, of the gut. We have the absorption and the digestion, we have the immune function, and we have the gut-brain crosstalk. The gut microbiota, it interplay with the, all the three functions of the gut, and uh, uh, as you will see in the uh, following slides. Regarding the, the, the gut microbiota, the, the, the role in the absorption and nutrition, you know, they have some enzymatic activity. They are, we have some indigestible uh, substances in our body, and these, these are, uh, the, the, the microbes are going to change into digestible substances, like short-chain fatty acid, and those are used as energy for the body, like 10% of energy in our body is supplied by the short-chain uh, fatty acids, and also it is used an, as an energy and nutrient for the, for the bacteria uh, themselves. Phytic acid in the grains, releasing mineral, uh, minerals, uh, vitamin B12, folic acid, vi uh, vitamin uh, uh, K are also, and also the bile metabolism. One of the important thing is the recycling in the bile metabolism. It is uh, in, in a uh, direct and indirect way is affected by the uh, gut uh, microbiota. Passing to the dysbiosis, when we have an imbalance between uh, the, the beneficial versus the, uh, uh, the, the normal convention uh, uh, in, the, in the bite, this will impact the health in, in many ways. There will be a disorder, uh, uh, disrupted metabolic uh, pathway, and this will lead uh, to, to, uh, to obesity, to insulin res resistance, uh, non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease is, is, is common in those with this uh, biosis and the metabolic syndrome as we all know. So when, when there is this biosis, uh, what will happen? There will be the adaptation, there will, there will be more food availability for that and more energy. And this in turn is going to lead to the metabolic effect including obesity, metabolic uh, syndrome, and uh, non-alcoholic fatty uh, liver uh, changes. Regarding the immune function, there, uh, uh, it interplays with the direct, direct uh, uh, defense against the microbes. Also, interaction and crosstalk, the immunity and the microbes, there is interplay. The immunity will affect the microbe, and the mi microbiota is going to uh, affect the immunity. And also, the development of the innate immune system early in, in life is very depend dependable. And they found that recently, very recently, they found that babies who are product of normal vaginal delivery because they are exposed to the uh, 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 microbiota at the genital area, they have better diversity and they have better outcome. Uh, than those who were prone uh, by cesarean deliveries because they are not exposed to these uh, factors. Regarding the, uh, the, 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 direct, uh, the direct effect of the, uh, of, uh, of the microbiota uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the immune system, there is, uh, there is production of bacteria uh, seen which is very effective. And also, yeah, th there is a competition there is a competition between the, uh, uh, for the, for the, uh, with the uh, uh, pathogenic bacteria. They compete, they compete with the pathogenic bacteria and they, uh, they take the energy. And also sometimes they, they block, they block the, uh, the, 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 the receptor for those uh, bacteria in, in, in a way or uh, another. Also, they stimulate the immune system by producing the secretory IgA for those uh, patients. They affect the gut motility and enhancing the, uh, the gut to get rid of this uh, pathogenic uh, bacteria and also the, uh, influence the other immune, immune uh, function. Uh, the development of the immune system is very uh, important in this. Yeah, the, the, those gut microbiota actually uh, they, they regulate the development of the, of the, of the cells and the, uh, they establish uh, the intestinal barrier. The intestinal barrier is the first barrier, is the first barrier against the, uh, any, any uh, pathogenic infection in the area. And also they, they produce some metabolites. 
they uh, control the, the development and the activation of the immune system in a way or, or another. Development of the uh, immune system, they signal the development of, of uh, the uh, T lymphocyte, uh, the, the lymphocyte, the B and the T lymphocyte subtests uh, are signaled by the gut microbiota in a way or another, and also they establish the ratio of T, T helper 1 to T helper uh, 2, and they uh, later on they will uh, make the body to have a tolerance or an allergy. Those with, with, uh, with diverse microbiota, they are going to have a tolerance rather than having uh, allergy to, uh, to different uh, substances. Uh, so, uh, in, in, in healthy environment, in healthy gut, and when there is normal gut microbiota, uh, there, uh, it will host the, 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 the whole, give the defense against the uh, infection. It will enhance the tissue repair in a way uh, or another, and also uh, it will make a homeostatic uh, balance in the uh, gut. While in, 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 in this biosis, there will be autoimmunity, forming autoantibodies against the uh, body himself, and tissue sepsis uh, and damage will occur in those with uh, this biosis, and also it is a, a leading for the development of, of diseases, and also there will be disruption of the hemostasis for those patients. In allergic disorder, the, the role of gut microbiota, and, and uh, if there is this, this biosis, the, you know, the, the maturation of gut microbiota, I mean the adaptive uh, immunity, it requires a, a, an instant and constant uh, microbial stimuli from the gut microbiota. So, there is a continuous crosstalk between the, the, the gut microbiota and the uh, immune system, whether uh, to develop tolerance or allergies. And, and uh, when someone has uh, normal gut mi microbiota, healthy gut commensal, they are going to have tolerance if they are exposed to allergens. While those with less diversity, they are more prone to develop allergic disorders when they are exposed to the same allergy. Um, uh, the gut uh, brain crosstalk, this is also very uh, important, uh, actually. And there is an axis, it's called gut brain axis, in a way or another. It is a, a, a bi directional signaling between the brain and the, and the gut microbiota. Uh, the brain will influence uh, the, uh, the gut. And the microbiota will influence the, 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 the mood, even the behavior. And sometimes, as, as we also, sometimes when we are exposed um, to some stressful condition, sometimes you feel as if you have some gaseous station. And this is, this is a real because there will be some uh, the derangement and some uh, problem with the uh, growth of the normal gut microbiota leading to those. And in another way, sometimes so those with, with some mood disorder uh, or some, some with, with abnormal uh, gut microbiota or dysbiosis, they will have uh, a bad mood and even other uh, psychological and behavior disorder. So, <clears throat> the gut microbiota, uh, the, the healthy, the normal gut microbiota are important for the gut physiology also and appropriate signaling uh, between the uh, gut and the uh, brain and also the maintenance, maintenance of uh, overall uh, health. Uh, in intestinal uh, dysbiosis, there will be derangement in digestion, there will be derangement in absorption, and in the immunity, and also alteration of the CNS function. They found that, uh, very strangely, they found that there are some neuroactive substances which are secreted by those gut microbiota. And those neuroactive substances, they work just as, as a, a, a neurotransmitters. It's very strange, and sometimes they even they call the gut, sometimes they call it the enteric immune system because it is very complex like that. So those neuroactive substances which are secreted by those normal gut commensal, they give a better mood if, if there is no dysbiosis. While in those with dysbiosis, they will have some uh, impairment of their mood and their, their action. So uh, uh, the impact of the government, it is some, some sort of interplay. The behavior, the brain development, and the microbial uh, colonization. Each one will affect the other in a way uh, or another. If someone has a CNS dys dysfunction, they are going to have disrupted uh, gut colonization and uh, dysbiosis.
and there is a direct uh, uh, signaling between both of them. Um, leading, if you have, if, if someone have um, the, the disrupted or uh, gut microbiota or dysbiosis, it will affect in another, uh, affecting the, the behavior, affecting the mood uh, and uh, psychological status and even an anxiety and uh, depression are related in a way or another to uh, gut uh, microbiota. <clears throat> In allergic disorder, and this is this is uh, very well documented, and as I said, it is a hot topic for for uh, researchers. Uh, infant and young children with allergies, they found they harbor a different gut microbiota than non-allergic uh, children. And in Western countries, actually, uh, when the hygiene improved, when the hygiene improved, when there is no ex exposure to diverse uh, microbiota, they found that as incidence of allergy now in developed countries and in Western countries is much higher than in developing countries because kids in younger age group, they are exposed to diverse uh, microorganisms. In obesity, uh, it is uh, documented that uh, human uh, genome, uh, they have uh, been found uh, to, to, to link between the gut microbiota and the composition of, of obesity. Some, 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 some researchers, they found that the uh, dysbiosis, they have even uh, increased appetite and more satiety to take more, leading to uh, obesity. And also the studies now are ongoing on the influence of gut microbiota uh, on the central regulation of the uh, food intake. In autism, we all know uh, uh, autistic children, they have, uh, they have very frequently, they have GI symptoms. Uh, I, 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 don't, I, I don't think any one of us who have faced a child with, with autism in the absence of, of one of the GI symptoms. And also, uh, the alteration of gut microbiota, as we said, because it is going to, to we have some oligo and, and polysaccharides, uh, if, if there are no these gut microbiota metabolizing the short chain fatty acid, and they, now they found in a way or another short fit, uh, chain fatty acid, and uh, they have a rule even in treatment of, the, of those with uh, autism. In the pain perception, lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, they found to, to, uh, to reduce uh, the, the pain in patients with uh, inflammatory uh, bowel uh, diseases. So, as a summary, as a summary, the three main functions of the gut, the digestion absorption, gut immune system, and gut-brain uh, gut crosstalk are affected. Regarding the digestion absorption, uh, uh, there will be nutrient bioavailability and digestion of these uh, 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 nutrients for, uh, for the body, production of short-chain fatty acids, production of essential other nutrients, as we said, B12, vitamin K, folate, uh, and others, and also uh, it regulates the energy homeostasis, in co it contributes to the uh, development of uh, and maintenance of, of gut and gut uh, mucosal development and uh, proper function of the uh, gut. Regarding the immune system, it guides the development of the innate immune system early in life and also uh, the development of proper tolerance when they are exposed to allergen. It uh, provides uh, defense against the pathogens and preventing the uh, colonization because they are going to compete with the site and protects it against inflammatory and uh, autoimmune uh, diseases. For the gut, uh, brain uh, crosstalk, it contributes in a way or another to the mood, to the satiety, and to the uh, pain perception, and even to the uh, general uh, well-being. Uh, 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 this is my email. Uh, feel free to contact me uh, anytime. And I would just to add, we are going to have uh, two uh, upcoming pediatric conferences. The first one is the Middle East Pediatric Conference. It will be in Istanbul, uh, 27 to 29 uh, June. And the other is the Regional Pediatric Conference. It will be um, uh, at 15 and 16 of August uh, this year. Thank you very much, and thank you for the chairperson. <clears throat> Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Khalaf, for this uh, comprehensive presentation about the role of uh, microbiota. Uh, uh, now uh, uh, the floor is open for uh, any questions. Yes? Can you concentrate it on the gut brain active? Yes. I think very important, very important, I just 
got brain active actually. And uh, this actually proved to be very, very important in some condition like allergy. And proper management of allergy could prevent a lot of mental disorder, including autism. So I think we have to, to start to think about another important axis, which is the skin brain axis. One uh, another comment is uh, uh, this by words. There is two important factors uh, uh, ruling uh, the dysbiosis. One of them is the antibiotic use and the uh, under over evaluated is the proton bomb inhibitor use. Unfortunately, we are abusing the proton bomb inhibitor use in treatment of gastroesophageal reflux disease and in another many, many problems even in the neonatal period. And this is actually a very important uh, risk factor to develop uh, Colostidium difficile uh, enterocolitis, which is very difficult to be treated, and by the way, it is treated by uh, giving the baby probiotic. So I think we have to start to think in a different way, not to concentrating only in the gut brain axis, but to concentrate also in the skin uh, brain axis. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, for your uh, comment. Actually, uh, regarding the, uh, the skin brain uh, crosstalk and the gut brain crosstalk, uh, I do uh, agree with you. And uh, the point is that, you know, uh, in adults, the, the surface area of skin uh, is one and a half square meter, while the surface area of the gut is like 30 square uh, meter. So it is the biggest uh, part of our body which is direct, in, in direct contact with the uh, environment. The second point regarding the use of proton pump inhibitors, actually uh, the very recent update which was published in last March uh, 2018 by uh, Nasbagan and Isbagan, and it was also supported by NICE guideline. They don't recommend because you have, they have the algorithm and they don't recommend to start uh, as an empirical uh, therapy. Before that, we were uh, actually, we were overusing uh, that, especially in infants, because it affects the, the composition of gut microbiota in a direct way. I, I totally agree with you that we should be uh, very careful when we start to use them. It should be uh, uh, upon the, those, uh, those guidelines. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, another questions? Yeah. Any comments? Okay. Thanks, Professor Khalad, Thank you very much. for this presentation. Thank you. And now closing with Dr. Uh, I thank again uh, Dr. Khalaf and Dr. Junit for their um, comprehensive talks actually and I think this is the end of uh, this session. This session comes to an end and thank you very much.